Hello. All right. Well, as we all know, we live in a critical age in humanity. With large advancements in technology, we have the abilities to, to create any type of future that we want to. That we can create the next supercomputer with unimaginable capabilities. Or we can create the next weapon of mass destruction. Yes, this uncertainty is what makes us weary of our future. But this is where futurology comes into play. Futurology is the study of the future based on patterns and inventions of the past. And by looking at how we've progressed through time, we can see how we will progress in the future. Sometimes we get it right. Such a case would be of John E. Watkins, a 1900s engineer. He accurately predicted the invention of digital color photography. That through this, we were able to capture all of nature's beautiful colors and develop them in an hour's worth of time. Another one of his invention, or his predictions, was of hothouse plants, or greenhouses. With this invention, we were able to increase food production dramatically in areas where plants were not originally native and or seasonal. However, sometimes we get things wrong, pretty wrong. In the case of the whale bus, <laughs> yes, <laughs> French scientists predicted this form of transatlantic travel that attached a capsule to a whale. Well, this green form of travel didn't exactly hit the mainstreams, probably for a good reason. The truth is, is there's a lot of things we do not know yet. Such an example of this would be of oil production. Some, place, some predictions say that we will run out in the next 40 years, some say the next 100. We don't really know when that will be but we need to be ready for when it does. And that's why we are here today. We are here to present to you our predictions of the next 100 years. And because in the end, it's up to us to create and shape the future that we need and that we will want. Now, if you allow me to, let's travel 100 years from today. Let's see how we're gonna get there with Nick, with transportation. Hey guys, so I don't know about you, but I think cars are like really cool, so I was really excited about getting to do transportation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we've come so far, but it's pretty astounding, and where we're going to go in the future. So old initiatives way back in the past, or everybody knows, you know, problems with transportation is like, a big one is global warming, right? Fossil fuels, we can't really burn those much longer, especially with a growing population. That's really bad, and considering it's Earth Day, we really need to focus on conserving our world. And so along with that, everybody's been in rush hour traffic, right? Yeah? So nobody likes that. And it's even worse, I think, if you're in a big city because then you're, you're all crowded on really little subways and buses. So big or small scale, transportation's kind of rough right now, and it's only going to get worse as our population grows. So in order to make energy more efficient, back in the late 50s and 60s, Ford, because, you know, middle of the Cold War, go America, why not, they decided to make prototypes for two nuclear vehicles. The one on the bottom left is called the Ford Seattle, and the one on the top right is the Ford Nucleon. Now, it was a really cool concept, but both of these vehicles were supposed to have nuclear reactors in the back, which, yeah, that's really cool, but a lot of people were afraid, like, you don't want to be driving, and then your car just starts having a nuclear meltdown. That's really, really bad for you and anyone else on the road around you. So due to the early form of technology, and they didn't know what to do with the waste, and because people were afraid, these never actually hit the production line. So these didn't really help anyone, and that's why we don't have nuclear cars right now. So today, everybody, you know, electric cars are the big thing right now. So real quick, can I see a raise of hands or show of hands? Does anybody have a Prius in here? All right. OK, well, so sorry, but I know a lot of people, no one really likes the Prius. Like, generally, you hear a Prius and you're kind of like, oh. And even if they look like that, they just, electric cars have a really bad rep. And so, even though that's kind of cool, that is really cool. That's the Mercedes SLS AMG. That's a fully automatic, uh, yeah, whoops, fully electric car. And it has over 700 horsepower, but it's still not really solving any problems because it's extremely inefficient. You can only drive for about two hours before you have to go recharge it. And if you're going on a long trip, that just doesn't work. And on top of that, electric cars, even though they're kind of saving the environment, the amount of fossil fuels that are burned to make that electricity is you still need to burn those in order to make that so it really counteracts itself and doesn't help a whole ton. 
So Cadillac decided, remember the nuclear cars? They were going to release this thing. This is Cadillac's thorium vehicle. And it's supposed to be a nuclear-powered vehicle, but they haven't actually given any dates on that. And this has been circulating for a couple years. So it's turning out not that promising like we originally thought. So I think we need to look bigger towards better forms of transportation that are cleaner and can transport people safer and faster. And this is where Elon Musk's Hyperloop comes in. So none of these have actually been built yet, but they're planning on building one from San Francisco to Los Angeles. It's a vacuum tube with completely, or with entirely no resistance, and you can hold a large number of people or you can make a smaller prototype. And it's powered by solar panels on top of the cart, and then they have magnets at regular intervals along the track in order to propel it faster. Now this can travel at the speed of sound, roughly over 760 miles an hour. So that's way faster than any other train we have right now. And so if you're thinking about it, everybody wants to go to Disney World, right? That's about two, whoa, whoa, that's happiest place in the world. It's 10 hours from here by car. That's a really long drive, and usually trips like that long, they go really poorly. But in this, you can make it in under two hours, which would be phenomenal, right? Going to the happiest place on Earth in two hours versus 10 crammed inside a little car. So this is actually, they're working on building one from San Francisco to LA, like I mentioned, but it's costing several billion dollars. Now, I know that's a really big number, but in the long run, due to the energy efficiency, and how safe these are, and just the environmental cost that this will save because we don't have to clean up after ourselves like we usually do now. This will save millions and billions of dollars later on, and it's a much cleaner and safer form of transportation. But in order to do any of these types of transportation, whether it's cars, buses, Hyperloop, we do need energy. And so here's Jack Sanford to talk to you about how we're going to get our energy in the next 100 years. Thank you, Nick. So Nick talked a lot about fossil fuels and uh, the greenhouse effect. So we need, so this is a bubble graph of the CO2 given off by each country. The U.S. and the European Union are the two biggest, as is expected. Uh, but there's supposed to be about a 56% increase uh, in the next 25 years. Most of that will be coming from China and India, because those countries are newly developing. So a lot of new people are going to start using electricity and using more of it. Uh, so we need to phase out fossil fuel burning and this kind of combustion. So everyone hears about solar when it comes to that regards and in looking in the future, but solar is not perfect. Uh, as anyone who lives in California knows, it's not cheap, costing more than 10 times regular fossil fuel methods. And on a cloudy day like shown here, you certainly wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to get the electricity you need. Uh, wind is also really popular. Um, it can, be, it can work during the night, but the wind doesn't blow all the time, and also there's limited space for where we can put wind turbines. Uh, so a better alternative is needed. So I want to talk about that better alternative. And one thing that's really important when it comes to picking a new source of energy is something called energy density. Uh, so what energy density is, simply, is how much electricity there is inside of a certain amount of stuff. So for the Coal stuff, uh, it's about 16 uh, megajoules per kilogram, that's the unit. Sugar is about 17, so it's a little bit more. Uh, coal that we burn in power, plant, power plants today is about 30, but these numbers are nothing. Uh, modern nuclear reactors can produce electricity from plutonium at a rate of 2.2 million. And in the very near future, we'll be able to use uranium in its full value of 88 million. So that's a lot of electricity for not a lot of material. Reactors today, like the nearby McGuire nuclear station shown here, uh, are part of the second generation of reactors, and this generation is pretty old. Uh, there are some third generation reactors, but we're mostly using reactors from the second generation. Um, they use plutonium, like shown, and so in the next couple years, we're going to have to start designing new nuclear reactors for the upcoming fourth generation, and these reactors are going to have to bring big changes to the game. Um, so here are some of the technologies being researched today. I don't know what that means. Um, stuff. So it's very complicated. Nuclear engineering is a very fast growing field. Uh, but some of these technologies, most all of these technologies are going to offer better safety, less waste, more electricity, and be a lot more reliable. So the, ele so the reactors of 2116 and 100 years are certainly going to be a combination of these technologies and more. Uh, and they're going to power the next, they're going to power the world in the next 100 years for the next thousand. So this is how we're going to power our homes and our cars and our transportation. So let's go to Brianna to talk about how we're going to power ourselves with food. Thank you. 
Our current world population is roughly 7.4 billion. However, it is constantly increasing as we have a higher birth rate than death rate. It is predicted that by 2050, our population will exceed 10 billion. This is the Earth's maximum carrying capacity. So at this point, we have to come up with new ideas to provide sustainably for our population. One way we can do that is by changing the way we eat. The demand for meat continues to increase, and by 2050, it is predicted to double. However, raising cow, cattle and chickens is very expensive and has a very large carbon footprint. It requires a lot of feed and water to raise. So, other than having meat, what is one type of food we can have? Fruits, vegetables, making the transition to becoming vegan and vegetarians. So one way that we can produce more of these fresh greens is by establishing hydroponic systems. These systems allow us to grow plants and vegetables indoors in various conditions. So the hydroponic systems are very simple. Water is pumped up from a reservoir through a, a pipe system which waters all the plants in cups. There are many different variations to these as we have some of our own hydroponic systems here at East Mech. Now, although fresh fruits and vegetables are great, we also need other kinds of nutrients to stay alive and active, one thing being protein. Yes, hamburgers, I know they look good, and meat is a great source of protein. However, by 2050, these are most likely not gonna be around. So we need to find a protein supplement. And that is when bugs come in. Yes, by 2050, we might be eating a lot of bugs. Bugs are plentiful, they are healthy, and they have a lot of nutrition. In fact, bugs, crickets in specific, are, have lots of protein. In 100 grams of dry cricket, 69% is protein, which is over double that of chicken. In addition to this, crickets are more efficient because they have a smaller carbon footprint. They require less water and feed to raise. So, if you guys are wondering what a meal in 2050 might look like, here you go. And no, this is not chicken. This is in fact an avocado bay bug salad. So other than, other than eating insects and salad and cookies, we have other everyday life changes that will be happening in our future. And here's Ethan Langley with more information. So I have a quick question for you guys. How many of you use a pager or a fax machine to talk to your friends today? Anybody? Okay, well, I know that all of you that raised your hands are actually lying. Um, <laughs> so just like now we used phones and text messaging instead of pagers and fax machines, in the future, we will be using thought transmission to communicate with other people. Now, I know this idea sounds a little crazy and you might be asking me how it's gonna happen. So it's actually really similar to the way that we communicate with people today. A little device will be implanted into your brain that picks up on thought signals, transmit those over the same radio waves that we send text messages, and it'll go to another person who has a receiving device in their brain and it'll just get coded back into a thought. And this may seem like an impossible idea, but Harvard University has already used a physical connection to transmit emotions from one person to another. So the next step is just kind of uploading that to the internet. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about is humanity itself. Since we've cracked the human genome, we were able to uh, discover something called CRISPR, which allows people to go, scientists to go in and cut out specific parts of the DNA sequence. This means that we can cure genetic diseases such as genetic blindness, sickle cell anemia, or certain genetic markers for cancer. Another way that this is going to change is it's going to open up the opportunity for designer babies. This is a very controversial, controversial subject, and it'll probably still be controversial in 100 years, but we'll definitely still have the option for it. People who take advantage of this opportunity will choose babies who are more attractive, healthier, and have longer lives, which will lead to a better, stronger human race in general. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about is jobs. So instead of having your typical blue collar jobs like we do today, working in a factory at, or steel, steel mills or something like that, you won't be able to do that. You won't actually make anything yourself. Instead, the jobs that we have will shift towards STEM and programming and you'll just tell a robot to make something for you. The next thing I'm going to talk about is housing. 
So Brianna told you that we're going to hit 10 billion people in 2050, and we just don't have enough land for that to work. So giant apartment skyscrapers like this one will become very commonplace, and the goal will be for energy efficiency. So this building funnels all of the wind into these turbines in the, in the center, which create electricity for the building, and all of the black panels that you see are solar panels. So the things that we've talked to you about today represent only a few of the nearly limitless possibilities available to us in the future. And ultimately, it's up to us and our generation to decide who we will be in 100 years. Thank you.